eh, keynote speaker per eh, parlare proprio di eh, un tema di grandissima attualità. Lo abbiamo toccato, eh, lo abbiamo accennato, l'innovazione, la tecnologia, gli algoritmi, i big data. Eh, che cosa significano, quanto possono essere una risorsa, quanto dobbiamo imparare a governarli. Eh, invito sul palco Emmanuel Letuzé, direttore di Data Pop-Up Alliance, un'organizzazione non governativa da lui cofondata nel 2013 con l'MIT Media Lab dell'Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Leto Se lavora sulle applicazioni e implicazioni proprio dei, da dei dati, dei big data, delle statistiche, della tecnologia digitale e dell'intelligenza artificiale per lo sviluppo umano, l'azione umanitaria e la democrazia. Emanuele Leto Se. Mi metto qua. Okay, um, so yeah, thank you very much for having me. So, um, I mean, it's both uh, yeah, an honor and a bit of pressure to open this uh, day of innovation. Um, and especially in only 15 minutes, I mean, the topic is, you know, pretty big. And so I chose to focus on that particular question, what innovation does the world really need? Uh, of course, the fact that really is in parentheses is, you know, the, an, a sense of, of a, a direction of where I'm going which is that I think there are some innovations, some technological innovations that are uh, actually quite useful, but not all, and that we need other kinds uh, of, um, of innovations. Um, so, well, you know, very quickly, uh, well, still want to, you know, thank the organizers, the funders, uh, the team has been really amazing. So the two foundations, uh, also my friend Simone, uh, who suggested that I come here. Um, and so, yeah, really happy. It's my first time in Milan, and I also want to say hi to the people who are in the, in the car, in Kampala, in Waga, in Nairobi, um, so yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not going to go through that, don't worry, but if you want to connect on LinkedIn, uh, you know, I'm happy to exchange, uh, uh, discuss. So, <clears throat> well, uh, so in short, to get to the, to get to the topic, so, um, and I'm trying to squeeze about 15 years of work into 15 minutes, or now something like 14 minutes, so it's not very easy. Um, but let's say about 10 years ago, 12, maybe 15 years ago, we've been in this data revolution, and it's, it's been called the big data revolution, now it's the AI revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, and so on. And there, was, there were lots of expectations that with all this technology, all these data, all these tools, it's all like, you know, we would be collectively better uh, equipped to kind of, you know, well, improve the state of the world. And so fast forwarding 15 years later, I mean, it's not all doom and gloom. I don't want to, you know, stretch, be too extreme uh, in saying that, you know, the world is a horrible place. I mean, there has been some progress on poverty, uh, etc. But overall, I mean, if we take a step back, I mean, I think we were, we were expecting um, many more and much more progress, and we could expect much more progress. I mean, if you look at, of course, the one in Ukraine, which was mentioned, uh, in South Sudan, in Eritrea, uh, risks of famine, uh, the you know, downgrading of democracy in many countries, inequalities, climate change, and so on and so forth. Um, and so the question that I ask myself, the core of my work, uh, is what's the role of data, what's the role of, of, of AI, how can it actually like course correct uh, and, and make some changes. So I'm also uh, kind of like, a, as I put in my the slide before, uh, kind of like a semi-failed cartoonist. So I do political cartooning. I did that when I was young for newspapers in, in, in France. And so I did this cartoon about, well, in 2019. Uh, and basically, you can see this little guy. So the point is that we have all this technology. We have all these data. So that's what he says. We're able to measure things like poverty at very fine levels of temporal, granular, granular, geographic granularities, um, but it doesn't seem to matter very much. And so it's this notion of matter, the same way you could, if you know Douglas North, uh, he, he asks, do institutions matter? Do they have a causal effect on outcomes? And so I ask myself the same question with data and measurement, like does it matter? And we can see, does it matter to measure the SDGs, to measure poverty? And I think often it doesn't matter enough. So it's one of the things I you know, think about and work on and I'm thinking of what are the innovations that are needed to, for data and technology and, and AI to matter more. And these questions, I think, have found like a new impetus, so to speak, with like, you know, new types of AI, of course, generative AI, 
so ChatGPT, etc. So recently, I wrote a, a book chapter, uh, so that's online, it's for free for this UNESCO Mila chapter on AI for the SDGs. And you can see here already a mention of a concept that I talk about of human AI. And so I'll talk to you in a few minutes about what I mean by human AI and how it fits into uh, my questioning and work about making data and measurement matter more. So first, when I was thinking, of, when I was preparing this, you know, with this, this chat, this talk, uh, I was thinking, okay, so what are some of the innovations that I think I needed? So first, and I, you know, again, I have 10 minutes left, so I can only share a few thoughts, suggest, uh, surface some of those topics. But first, I think it's um, important to start on, you know, pretty strong conceptual grounds. So I'm, I'm French, as you can hear, and so I like definitions. I like to define topics and, and, and concepts before getting into um, you know, further discussion. So the first thing I did about eight years ago was to define you know, data, big data, and now AI as an ecosystem, not just as the data. And so I came up with this framework, what I call the four Cs, where so the four Cs stands for crumbs, so it's the data. It's the little pieces of data that we leave behind. It's the fuel of the AI system, okay? But around that, you also need capacities. So you need human capacities, technological capacities, and so on and so forth. And then you have communities, and communities, you can think of rules, regulations, partnerships, so it's the kind of like the political economy. Political economy. And around that, you have what I call the AI culture. Or So it's all the incentives, uh, the expectations, the norms that people have. And so I think this is a useful framework to start thinking about what, what's going on? What are the gaps? What, what are the investments that are needed? So that's one first, let's say, my, one of my small innovations, I mean, at least that's the way I think about it, it is a conceptual one. Then, uh, and just to make the point about the importance of culture, is that you know, to make data matter, we think often that data is sufficient, that you know, let the, you know, the, the numbers speak. Well, the numbers don't speak for themselves if people don't believe in the, number, in the numbers. And so I think we also have a, a crisis of trust uh, and we've seen that with COVID, we've seen that with inflation, we've, we've seen disinformation, we see polarization and so on and so forth. So what Bruno Latour, the French philosopher, sociologist who, who passed away last year, uh, stressed is the importance of having this common culture that you need institutions that can be trusted. You need a more or less reliable free media for societies to function, for, for data and measurement and statistics to matter. Otherwise, it's very difficult for them to have the kind of transformative effect that we think we may have. So another kind of like, you know, innovation or something that you know, I think is important is also to have a kind of like a theory of change. So when we say, okay, data and measurement can do that. Okay, what's, what are we saying? What is the process that we have in mind? And so the process that I have in mind is, is reflected by these little you know, piggy tail loops. Okay, so what is that? I mean, it's just basically that's how I think that machine learning works and how I think human learning wor works. If you have kids, so I have you know, three daughters, when they start walking, they fall and then they adapt and you know, so it's the story of you know, adaptation. So I think they go through this process to improve their performance. And so you can apply this to human societies and many things like responding to COVID, uh, fighting gender-based violence, you know, lots of things. I think we, we go through these things. And so, this process has been, has been actually studied, uh, and so there is something that is called the Dunning-Kruger effect, where you can map uh, so competence as a function of performance, and you see it's not linear, etc. Here, what I'm allowing is for this process to be not just non-linear, but also to go back in time. So I'm saying sometimes we go back in time, we fail, you know, we fail, and we just, you know, there's a crisis, we, we just fail. And so, it's a bit conceptual, right? Okay, but at least you know it's colorful, so maybe it's you know engaging, etc. So that's what I think does or may happen uh, in like you know in societies. And so you have these four quadrants. I'll go super quickly. Basically, you and so you may think of uh, you know the performance of uh, the Italian society or, or or your organization, you know whatever. So you you know you're doing well. So this is in quadrant one, and you're you know, confident, you gain confidence, and then your performance goes down, something is wrong, um, and, but your, your confidence continues to increase because you, you didn't get the feedback that something was going wrong. Then you get the feedback, you freak out, and then you hopefully are able to do something, and you don't really know yet if it's gonna have an effect, but then you go back up, and you go up on this trajectory. So it's just a mental framework, it's just something 
that's the way I think about how like human societies can adapt, can adjust, can improve, etc. And I call this human AI. So I mentioned that before. And so for me, human AI is it's two things. It's using AI and technology as an instrument to better measure things, to optimize things, to do you know like very discrete. So it's like narrow AI if you want. But it's also using or thinking of AI as an inspiration for how human societies can learn. The irony, of, of course, is that AI was called AI or in intelligence because of human intelligence. And I'm saying now we should go back, like do the, the reverse. We should actually try to equate, um, yeah, do the other way around. And so I think that can help us achieve a number of things, improve. Um, you know, we used to do things in the past that we don't do anymore because I think we've learned. Uh, over time, that it didn't yield like you know very good um, very good outcomes, you know putting people in jail for petty crimes. I don't think it works. But for that to happen, you need to have these feedback loops. So um, next, the role of data in there. So I'm going to go you know very fast. But I think data has three functions. It's data as a lens. So it's capturing human reality, turning them into numbers that people can comprehend. Okay. Data as a language, that's critical. It's talking about data. It's talking through data. So it's having democratic discussions on the basis um, of some facts. But for that, as we said, as we've seen, uh, you need some trust. And then data as a lever. It means making actions, taking decisions, um, setting goals. So you could say, I was talking to, talking to Eric yesterday, OK, if you want a cooling corridors, then you need to do it. And you need to set targets. And you need to implement it. And so when data has these three functions at the same time, I think you can see change. Um, and that falls into my loops because I think this this is this is how data actually allows these loops to happen. That's this for me is the key role of data and statistics. It is to make those loops possible. So I'll finish in two minutes. I'm sorry. It's one key thing are social and legal innovations. So we there are lots of technological innovations. Increasingly, we are trying. Some people are trying to have kind of like you know human in the loop innovations or society in the loop innovation. What, so in the loop, it could be my little feedback loops. So the point, the question is, OK, how can we get people to be, especially local communities, for instance, who are far away from decision-making centers, et cetera, or at least official you know, global ones, how can they be part of that? And so there are you know, pilots and tests. We're testing some governance systems called the code. Uh, OpenAI just put out a call for proposals to embed democratic inputs to AI. So there are those kinds of discussions. How can we also foster social innovations uh, to make this, the development and the use of technology more participatory, more, more democratic? And in conclusion, uh, I think that just as an example, I think using private data, sensitive data, is actually uh, very important. So it sounds risky. It sounds a bit scary to use telecom data, for instance. But if this has been done in Italy, for instance, with several like uh, telecom operators. And for me, there are ways to do that, so to use uh, sen this sensitive data in privacy preserving and participatory ways. One example, and it feeds into my loops of things. I think it, it fuels the system of improvement through feedbacks. One such example is the Opal project, which is a kind of poly innovation. So that's what I call poly, poly innovations, where you have a technological innovation, a cultural innovation, a social innovation, you have a governance system. And I think this is, these are the kinds, so this is my last slide, and I think these are the kinds of innovations that we need. So innovations that tackle a real world problem um, and that combine elements of technological innovations, cultural innovations, social innovations. Um, and so we are uh, pitching in two days in Luxembourg to WFP this project, Opal for Humanitarian Action, to try and uh, anticipate and better prepare for the impacts of climate change on uh, vulnerable populations in Senegal. Uh, so this is just a very concrete example, but for me, it reflects what I've tried to, you know, to, to explain in terms of how I think data and AI could matter more through these kinds of poly innovations. Thank you. Grazie.